All right. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to welcome you to the latest installment of our Florida Talks at Home series. My name is Keith Simmons. I'm the Communications Director here at Florida Humanities. And I want to give just a brief introduction in advance of our program this evening with Diane Roberts. I think you're going to be in for a very special treat tonight. Uh, now, normally, Florida Humanities works with cultural partners across the state to make programming like this possible in person. But obviously, that can't happen right now. So our goal is to make this virtual series a regular event until we can begin convening in person once again. Uh, we have a special program next week that I also want to mention to you really briefly with our friends at Braver Angels. The holiday season is right around the corner. And whether you choose to gather in person or remotely, one thing is certain, family disagreements over politics. That's why Families and Politics is a workshop to help us understand why family differences over politics are uniquely challenging, to help recognize some of the common roles family members play in some of these disagreements, and to develop strategies for handling a family's political differences in a constructive way. This program is going to take place on Tuesday, December 15th at 630. You can learn more about it and register by going to our website, floridahumanities.org slash events. Now, at the end of tonight's presentation, you're going to receive a short feedback survey in your email. We would greatly appreciate it if you took the time uh, to fill it out for us. Let us know how we did, how we can improve in the future. Um, if you have any questions for Diane during our, our conversation tonight, go ahead and type them down in the chat box that's on the right of your screen. And we're going to do our best to get to as many questions as we can this evening. Your support, by the way, is essential to helping to sustain these programs. If you enjoy tonight's program, we ask that you consider visiting floridahumanities.org slash support to contribute to our organization. And so tonight, again, we welcome Diane Roberts, who's a professor of English at Florida State University. She specializes in Southern culture and is an author, columnist, essayist, radio commentator, and, re and reviewer. She earned her doctorate at Oxford University. So with that, let's welcome Diane Roberts. Hello. And thank you all so much for joining us virtually. Um, I know it's an awkward form uh, and it's weird to stare at people on screen. I don't love it, but it beats being COVIDized. So thank you all so much for signing up for this. I'm very grateful that you took the trouble and the time. So thank you again. Um, I give very informal talks, so I'm going to encourage you to think questions, things you want to ask me. I'm always happy to uh, tell you when I don't know something, too. Um, I, I, there's a lot I don't know. It's a sad thing. But uh, I do know a few things about Florida. Uh, my family's lived here a long time, and so I know a lot about them. Um, we are, we're sort of swamp people. And we're not sort of swamp people. We're definitely swamp people. Um, so I feel this great sense of commitment to Florida. However weird it gets, it's mine and and I love it. But what I'm going to talk to y'all tonight about, it, well, talk to y'all about tonight, I do speak English and as well as teach it, is how Florida's landscapes, these are physical landscapes, social landscapes, cultural landscapes, political landscapes, all kinds of landscapes, how they've been shaped by all of the people that have lived in Florida, all of the people that have tried to create Florida in some image in their minds to make Florida into uh, a place that they envision as a wonderful or even ideal place, um, a place that they want to live. Um, and that they want to bring up children or they want they see as sacred or they, in some cases, want to make a fast buck off of. Kind of depends on who. Um, Florida is a very strange state, as I think everyone has realized with the Florida man memes that go around. You know, we do seem to be a heart of weirdness in the United States. Every state has its weirdness. Florida, I like to think, is especially gifted um, and that we are better at weirdness than most people. Which if you think about it, Florida 
is is three sides of water. You know, it's an isthmus. The first map makers, first European map makers, thought it was probably an island because they could just see this bit sticking in the ocean and they didn't know what else it was. So it was sort of thought of as this place that was sui generis, nothing like it, that Florida was this kind of quasi enchanted place when it wasn't being a threatening place. Now, we often talk about, or we used to talk about who discovered Florida. And the truth is nobody discovered Florida. Florida has been occupied by humans for 12,000 years. It's very hard to discover a place that has people living in it. I mean, the Spanish always said they discovered it, but they only discovered it for themselves. They didn't discover it for the world. Uh, there were these people, uh, different Indian nations, native people related to the paleo Indians who had been here forever. Uh, some of you probably are familiar with say, oh, the Whedon Island culture, which is a, a mound building and pottery making culture uh, from 15 to 1900 years ago. They did very beautiful, beautiful work. These were not people that you would normally call primitive. We do call them primitive, but we shouldn't call them primitive. Um, I like to remind people that before the Spanish ever came, there was a, a whole series of thriving uh, cultures in Florida. There were civilizations in Florida. People made those mounds. Um, I live very close to the Lake Jackson mounds here in North Florida. These are 12 huge mounds. They're not as big as they used to be. because Farmers used to plow them in the 19th century and early 20th century, but they're big, big mounds. They were a sacred site. They're not burial mounds. They were a sacred site on the shore of a large, large lake. Um, they were important and they are magnificent in, gosh, closer to say St. Pete, Tampa, the Madeira Bickle Mound, place I used to like to go. Um, I understand it's in a lot better shape now than it was 20 years ago, but it's a beautiful, huge mound. We have mounds all over the state. Now, some of the mounds are what are called middens. They were just kind of the landfill, they were the trash pile for everybody's oyster shells and leftover whatever it was. Remember, they didn't have a whole lot of leftover whatever it was, but those things are not the ones I'm talking about. I'm talking about Madeira Bickle and um, the uh, Love Mound and the, oh, the ones at Lake Jackson and many more that you don't ever hear about because they're not in state parks. Those were an attempt to shape the landscape to look like something that was a vision, a religious or artistic or both vision of the world. No, maybe to get closer to the sky, maybe so the chief could live on top of a big hill if he didn't have a hill and be able to see everything. But they were a manipulation of the landscape and they were saying something about the relationship of people to nature and to infinity in much the same way Chartres Cathedral in France is saying something about the relationship of 12th and 13th century Europeans and their relationship to the divine and to life on earth. Um, we tend to think somehow Chartres Cathedral is better than the mounds because it's made of stone and it has stained glass windows. I'm not sure that's the right way to think about it. So if you consider that some of the mounds were built at just about the same time as, as some of the great cathedrals like Chartres, then you might have a different way of seeing Florida. Um, certainly when the Spanish came in the 15th century and more in the 16th, they were looking for, well, they were looking for gold and emeralds like they found in Peru, which was, a very nice addition to the national treasures, but they were also looking for souls and they were trying to 
work their way. This is a kind of weird extension of the medieval crusades, but work their way to Jerusalem through the new world to stop the expansion of any religion other than Christianity, you know, and get gold in the emeralds. Um, and to basically put their stamp on Florida and to convert the natives to Roman Catholicism and turn them into good citizens of the King of Spain. Florida had this problem though, unlike Peru or Colombia or Mexico, we were not rich in gold and silver and gemstones. We were not rich in anything that the Spanish thought was worth a damn, quite frankly. Um, they were disappointed, shall we say, and took their disappointment out on some of the native peoples who also retaliated against them. So things got a little hairy. Um, you can imagine the scene, especially when you had a kind of hot-headed conquistador. That's not a really helpful term, but that's what they're still called in a lot of history books. But a hot-headed guy like Panfilo de Narvaez, who, who was grumpy, uh, or, or Hernando de Soto. And these guys kind of went around with edicts in Latin from uh, the bishops and the king of Spain, which they read to the Tecesta and the Apalachi and, you know, whoever else they encountered and demanded that they become subjects and Catholics. And if the response wasn't good, then they the Spanish got violent with people, which is sort of weird because why did they think they all understood Latin? I mean, most Spanish common soldiers didn't understand Latin. But there you go. Um, the Spanish didn't know quite what to make of any of this. I mean, remember they thought they were coming somewhere else. They thought they were going to India. And what happened was that they saw magical things, which may or may not have been there because they expected magic where they were going. Christopher Columbus's uh, second voyage, he kept a diary and he was writing about, you know, how the sailors said they saw mermaids, which the sailors were probably extra desperate and lonely because it seems the mermaids might have been manatees, um, which don't look a lot like Ariel in The Little Mermaid. They don't have long flowing hair and, you know, sexy shell bras and shiny tails. Um, but hey, you spend a lot of time on a ship. Maybe they look good. I don't know. But anyway, um, they saw things like that. They There was a legend about a fountain of youth. That's a bit later, though you will notice if you've ever done any touring around Florida, that uh, it didn't take Floridians long to jump on that legend. A hundred years after Juan Ponce de Leon died, his biographer talked about this fountain of youth. And I think we have three or four of them now. There's one in St. Augustine that'll cost you, I think, five bucks to go near. It's sulfur water and it smells like rotten eggs. I don't know how that's youthful. Uh, there's one in West Florida at Ponce Leon Springs. Uh, Wakala Springs used to claim to be it. Uh, and there are a couple of others down further in the southern part of the state. So what does it say that this is a place which was associated with mermaids and fountains of youth? Well, we still have mermaids, thank God, at Wiki Wachi. Um, and I still think they're much better mermaids than anything Disney ever came up with. They're, they're very, very good swimmers and uh, put on shows and look extremely beautiful. And uh, if you haven't been to Wiki Wachi, please go. Because that's an example of how one guy took a look at a perfectly nice, normal, for us, Florida has a lot of springs, lots and lots of freshwater springs, more um, magnitude one springs than anywhere in America, indeed the world, and thought to himself, I know what I'll do. I'll build an underwater theater and I'll have mermaids that sing underwater and dance. And 
wear wonderful costumes and put on shows. That's an example of taking something that's natural and magical and making it more so, which is in a way the story of Florida. Now, subsequent Europeans came to Florida and tried to make something of it. Um, the French were going to make something of it, but they kept being murdered by the Spanish because the French first sent Huguenots, Protestants, and that irritated the Spanish, so that didn't work. Um, the English came eventually. I'm not going to go into all. There was a whole lot of trading of Florida. Florida was kind of the redheaded stepchild. People didn't much want it because you couldn't make money off it. It was very hard to, to realize a buck. Uh, the Spanish established missions and you know, at least figured they'd save the souls even if they couldn't find the treasure. Um, but it was all just a bit half-hearted. The English just sort of thought it looked like a useful thing to hold on to sticking out into the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean um, for you know, the continent of North America, uh, which they then traded back to the Spanish in 1783 after the Revolutionary War. Florida, as I'm sure y'all remember, was a loyalist colony in the Revolutionary War. Florida favored the British. All 16 people lived in Florida, 16 European descended people. But the British started to see the Florida Peninsula in a different way. This was the 18th century and the colonies were sort of transitioning into being what later becomes the United States. And a guy named William Bartram came down. His father was a botanist. He was a botanist. They were cartographers um, based in Philadelphia, thought of themselves as Englishmen. William Bartram just fell in love with Florida, especially the St. John's country. And he wrote about it as if he had died and gone to heaven. Indeed, he calls it Eden. He calls it paradise. The man was selling Florida for the first time in a way that was truly something we can recognize now. You know, when, when um, Florida is advertised in a magazine, I don't think anybody ever mentions the downsides because why would they? You're trying to sell somebody a vacation or a lot or a condo or whatever. William Bartram didn't have anything like that to sell, but he was trying to sell the idea of this place as nature's greatest, greatest display. He went down the St. John's River and wrote about it as a greater river than any other. He talked about the springs were like blue ether, you know, and that they were magical. He wrote about the woods as being magnificent, um, as being like ante rooms, I'm garbling his quote, but in the sovereign palace of the creator, um, you know, it, it's like heaven. Never once did the man mention mosquitoes, not once. So that's why I'm calling it selling Florida because, you know, you all know that not mentioning mosquitoes uh, is really, really dishonest, shall we say? I'm sure he was eaten up by mosquitoes. He just didn't mention it uh, and the hurricanes and the everything else. But if you buy Florida as paradise, maybe you put up with it. Maybe it's okay. Florida became American really for strategic purposes. Andrew Jackson did not think Florida was paradise. We're now talking about the time of 1818 when Andrew Jackson, who was just as grumpy as those Spanish conquistadors, maybe grumpier, um, maybe even more hostile. He was a very hostile fellow. Uh, didn't like Florida. He was Florida's first territorial governor, wrote letters about how awful it was, and, you know, full of strange people. He did mention the mosquitoes and he mentioned the malaria and all the other sort of nasty diseases you could get. Um, that's why he didn't stick around for a long time. But before then, he was raiding 
Florida. He was violating um, international boundaries um, and not because he wanted to liberate Florida from the Spanish in any kind of good American sort of let's free everybody way. Quite the opposite. The Spanish and um, the native people who lived there by then, the Seminoles, had a bad habit, according to Andrew Jackson, of inviting slaves in Georgia to run away from their plantations. Because the Seminoles had this very fascinating culture where they weren't really interested in your ethnicity or your racial background. If you learn to speak their languages, then you became one of them. So they didn't care if you were black or white or what. One of the most famous of the Seminole leaders, um, a little later than, than Andrew Jackson's encounters with the Seminoles, uh, Osceola, his, well, he was a very unusual person in terms of his family. He was tri-racial. He was part Native American, part African American, and part white. His father was British, and he, that was just the most terrifying thing in the world to a white slave society. And it was also terrifying if your slaves are running away. Remember, if you're a southern plantation holder, your wealth is in your slaves. Your slaves first, your land second. So Jackson found this intolerable. And, you know, after he beat up on the Spanish forts at Pensacola and St. Mark's, then he figured, you know, that would pretty much do it. And it did. The Spanish were like, fine, you want it so bad, you can have it. And so Florida became American. And a whole new passel of people arrived with different sets of things they wanted to turn Florida into. These were the people who founded plantations, slaveholders. They came with enslaved people, and their vision was something they read in novels by, say, Sir Walter Scott. So up here in Tallahassee, where I live, uh, most of the land, most of the land that's the good land, was cotton land. It was plantation land. And they named their plantations things like Waverly and Goodwood um, and let Loch Acre and oh, on and on and on. It was just plantations as far as the eye could see where they tried to recreate basically England or Scotland or France. You know, that's what they were going for. So they named, now think about this, it's Florida, all right? It's hot, it's sticky. But nonetheless, they decided that a fun thing to do in Tallahassee in the 1830s and 40s was to joust in tin armor. And uh, they did. They had a joust every Christmas time. Young men from the plantations would get on horses and wear lavish outfits and call themselves things like the Knight of the White Plume um, or you know, the mystery night, and they would knock each other off of their horses and make a great to-do of the young ladies that were there. In Florida, in the heat, you know, obviously not Scotland, obviously not England, and yet this was what they were trying to make the place into. And you all can see how this goes for all of Florida's history. You know, when Florida starts to become a tourist destination uh, after the railroads are built down each coast, Mr. Plant down the West Coast, Mr. Flagler down the East Coast, and they build these pleasure palaces that are like, you know, the hybrid love children of the Kremlin, St. Mark's in Venice, and Windsor Castle. Um, these are some wacky architectures. Um, University of Tampa. Okay, that's that's a plant deal. And that is one of my favorite buildings because that's like every style of architecture that you can think of and some you hadn't thought of. Um, if you think of Flagler's hotels, you can still see a grand example at Flagler College in St. Augustine. You know, the kind of 
Mediterranean fantasy, sort of part Spanish, part Italian, part Moroccan, part who knows what. Um, they called it Orientalist. In the 19th century, the Orient actually started in Spain. Then you could work your way east. They had a very large understanding of what Oriental was. Um, you know, or a Palladian mansion like the Breakers Hotel. These were fantasies. These were nothing to do with anything indigenously Floridian. Um, I guess maybe they were if you, you count having a good view of the beach, because you know, everybody wanted a good view of the beach. But the architecture and the kind of plants that were put in, you know, lemon trees, um, eventually all of these things brought to South Florida because it didn't look tropical enough. Melaleuca, which is not a native plant. I mean, we do this to ourselves over and over and over again in Florida, um, where whatever we have doesn't seem to be good enough. Naturally, this reaches, and I'm skipping over Coral Gables, and I'm skipping over um, what we were going to do to the Everglades, that is to say, drain the Everglades and build something that was supposed to be more or less Tuscany. You know, you just wouldn't be able to tell the difference between South Florida and Tuscany there for, that was the plan. That didn't work. Turned out to be much harder to drain the Everglades than anybody thought. Thank God. But we now have maybe the greatest example of an odd imposition on the land that anyone ever thought of, which of course is Disney World. Disney World, which is full of ersatz everything, you know, a castle that's a kind of um, bad dream version of a French chateau, um, all of these places that exist in fictional worlds, you know, the places that are supposed to be representational of, of whole countries, European countries. Um, you know, it is a fantasy land. It is a place that was considered to be so without a history and so without a character of its own that you can impose anything on it. And I'll tell you the reason I start with, with the mound builders here in Florida is that in a way they were imposing their own visions on the land, but in a different way, in a way that worked with it, not against it and in a way that I think understood that the land had its own ecology and its own history rather than imposing one from outside that was pre-existing but that's not really how we do things anymore we we look at Florida and want to make it more so my favorite example of this is uh, not the current president of the University of Florida, but I think the previous president of the University of Florida felt that the campus didn't look sufficiently Floridian because to him, that meant palm trees. Now, y'all can get out a map and notice where Gainesville is. Gainesville is in North Florida. Gainesville has live oak trees, lots and lots and lots of live oak trees and magnolias. So they still brought in a whole bunch of palm trees. Some of them did fine. Uh, some of them were the wrong kind of palm trees. We have palm trees in North Florida, just not all the kinds of palm trees, and froze to death. This is what happens when you decide that a place isn't itself enough because you don't know about the history and the ecology and the flora and the fauna of a place. And Florida, for some reason, I mean, humans do this everywhere. You can, you can pick your place and, and we can come up with examples of how humans do this. They do this in Europe. They've always done it in Europe. I mean, what is Stonehenge but an imposition on the landscape to say, okay, we're going to put this big thing, whatever it is, monument, 
uh, astronomical calculator, sacred space, whatever, right here because we think this makes it more so. Um, you know, all of the landscape of Northern Europe, unless it's really mountainous and craggy, has been manipulated by humans. There was once a forest that went from Southern England all the way up through Scotland. That was all forested land. There are tiny pieces of it left, very tiny pieces. And it's hard to imagine what it was like when that was all forest land. Um, you know, we, we do this. Louis the 14th did it at Versailles, you know, by taking a blameless little stream and making it run his fountains. This is a human thing to do, to manipulate the landscape, to try and realize your dreams through the landscape. I don't think any, any place has ever jumped in with both feet quite like Florida. And of course, we're still doing it. We're still building housing uh, developments that are named after whatever it is that doesn't live there anymore because we killed it, you know, Eagle Run or, you know, Deer Park or whatever. Um, we are still trying to pretend that nature isn't going to win when it probably will. I don't know how many hurricanes it'll take because much as we reshape the landscape, nature's going to reshape it more quickly, efficiently, and violently, and not maybe in the way that we like. But I've always thought of Florida as a dream state. I wrote a book called Dream State. It's a place where people came and tried to create a dream, whatever their dream was, you know, to make it what they wanted to see to you know, build houses that looked like something out of a poem or out of a history book or maybe just out of their own heads. You know, that Florida was a place you were not only allowed to do that, you were encouraged to do that. Um, and it is something that's very human, often very damaging, usually gratifyingly weird. Uh, it's one of the reasons I love Florida because it's weird. You know, my own family, um, the first one arrived in 1799 and he remade himself as well as some of the landscape. The King of Spain was giving land away in Spanish East Florida. And this fellow, his name was Francois Bruard, who had been born in Normandy in France, um, had married a woman of Scottish descent in South Carolina and came down to get that free land in what is now Nassau County. And this fellow quickly figured out which way the wind was blowing and anglicized his name to Francis Broward. And they established farms and timber mills and reshaped the forest, which a lot of which they sent elsewhere to build up places. And he made his own kind of little kingdom. Never forgot they were French, though. The Browards actually gave their children names that were um, both impressive and hilarious. And that there was a governor called Napoleon Bonaparte Broward who's a fair, sort of terribly, terribly distant cousin of mine. He had a sister named Josephine. I'm not making this up. They had other children that they named after um, revolutionaries. So there was a Washington Broward and there was a Pulaski Broward. And I mean, they were making themselves fit a kind of American reinvention ideal uh, as well as honoring what they saw as their great revolutionary past. And that, again, is part of the American dream that you can reinvent yourself over and over again, um, that your past doesn't matter. Well, I think we know that's not true, but we're going to still tell ourselves that we can do that. We can ignore history. Um, and you can manipulate the world in a way that you just 
can defy gravity, history, politics, economics, that somehow your vision will prevail, that you can make the land what you want, you can make yourself what you want. And that's both wonderful and kind of charmingly childish um, in that at some point reality hits you, whether it's a hurricane here in Florida or at the moment, a global pandemic, which is causing us to stare at each other on a screen. And I think with that, I'm going to shut up because I'd so much rather hear your questions and talk to you because I feel like I'm talking to myself. I can't see you. Um, so if I look vague, that's why I'm used to teaching in a classroom where I have humans to look at. And I can see it when they're rolling their eyes and going, yeah. So yeah, open her up, Keith. I like well, I think that <laughs> I think we're certainly in, in the opposite direction of rolling our eyes. I mean, I think it's a really, really interesting start for hopefully some some good conversation. Thanks so much for um, starting us off with that. I think one of the questions that we have from Rebecca, just a little bit of clarification is um, talking about especially the mounds. Um, other than the mounds that you see in state and local parks, are there is there a resource where you can find mounds sort of in, in any other locations in the state? I saw that question and I wish I knew a great answer. Um, I would imagine there is a way and I would look up and see uh, music. The museum in Gainesville is a great resource. Uh, they are, God, a bunch of archaeologists there and also look at state websites uh, to do with the state archaeologist in Tallahassee. Uh, I would think they have a map um, of the at least the ones that are known. Um, it's a thing I, I should know and I've never considered. Uh, there are mounds that most of them, lots of them are damaged. And you can just find them sometimes in the woods. Now, I'm not saying that other people hadn't found them first. I'm sure they had. But, you know, they were inconvenient. If you were a farmer, a mound is a real inconvenient thing. You don't, not, you don't want a mound in your field. That's why the ones at Lake Jackson are so damaged. And only three of them are near their original size. Uh, Madeira Bickle is a good one because I think it just was hidden in the woods for so long. Um, that's the one I think you drive across the Sunshine Skyway and it's kind of down to the right. They have signs now. I mean, when I went to find it before, it was just in terrible, terrible shape. But it's a beautiful, beautiful mound. And it is, gosh, it's 1,500 years old. It's now 20 feet high, but it was probably a lot higher in its day. And you can imagine how impressive that is. So I think that's a... That might be one for Mr. Google and uh, and the state. The state will know. I mean, I, there have been surveys. The archaeologists survey this stuff. I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, well, no, I think that's that's certainly uh, all right. Here's somebody with a good Trail of Florida's Indian heritage that is good. Oh, well, that's, that's right. Good. I didn't quite realize that we we did fund. Yeah, um, a trail that has a map with some of those things included. So um, hopefully, I'll be able to to pull up that link so I can provide that for for our audience That's members. Cool. And Thank you very much, Patricia. Um, and I, I just one word of caution: a lot of these mounds that are not state owned are on private property. So you know you don't want Elmer Fudd shooting you. Just be careful. No, that's definitely the last thing that, that we would want. But it's sort of in the same vein of, of preservation. It kind of goes to, to uh, a question that Linda asked, which is, you know, there's, I think there's this dynamic of trying to improve or sort of change Florida's landscapes. And then sometimes there's preservation. So we certainly see that with the Indian mounds. And I think another place where we tend to see that is with plantations. Yeah. Um, and so... I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about that in the way that, you know, plantations had been used. You mentioned this earlier that, you know, plantation uh, or, or slavery and using plantations as a way that you try to 
get some sort of economic benefit from the land, but then it's also preserving these sites long after slavery is ended. Oh yes, and preserving them in a loving way, which isn't afforded to say the places that the people that work the land, the enslaved people live. There are very, very, very few slave cabins left. And of course, you know, people argue, well, they weren't big and grand and pretty. No, they weren't. Um, but it's interesting that a lot of the plantations are now, I mean, when I was a kid, plantations were houses were just, they were these objects of love and devotion. They were beautiful. And we would hear that William, um, oh, what was he called? Was it William Croom? The Crooms all had very English names. It might've been Richard Croom. But anyway, they, they built Goodwood. Goodwood's the fanciest plantation house in Tallahassee. Um, and it was built in the Italianate style. And he didn't build it, enslaved people built it. Richard Keith called and build the Grove, which is now a museum. And if anybody's in Tallahassee, back when they open it up, uh, I urge you to go there because it does a cracking job of, of reminding you what really went on and who really did what. Richard Keith Call was a slaveholder. He was not a secessionist, though. He was also an early governor of Florida. And he, he was an interesting guy. Um, he really fought against secession, which Florida, by the way, was the third state to secede. So in the question about racism built into the DNA of Florida, uh, as, as a part of the United States, absolutely. Uh, you could argue maybe earlier, but there are also these other, the Spanish were interesting in this way. Um, there was a black man with uh, Juan Ponce de Leon. Um, Spain, you remember, was very close to North Africa. Spain had been under Moorish rule, Northern African uh, rule for 800 years. It had a slightly different attitude towards skin color um, than Northern Europeans. A guy called uh, Cabeza, well, this is his title. He has a very long name, but Cabeza de Vaca, which means cowhead if you speak Spanish, which weirdly was a title of honor. Um, and you can look up why. It's a long convoluted story about the Christians beating the Moors in Spain. But he uh, got lost. He got lost. This is when Narvaez very ridiculously didn't know where he was going and got lost too. And they ended up trying to drink seawater and ate, ate their own horses. And Cabeza de Vaca and a few of his pals are lost in the North Florida swamps and start making their way west. Now, eventually they got to Mexico, but not until Cabeza de Vaca had basically become a shaman. He had very much blended with native people. He wrote arguing that you can't just impose things on these people. They're not inferior just because they look different from you and me. Uh, he was of course in the minority, but you know, he, uh, he was an interesting guy. But by the time Andrew Jackson is involved and by the time the Seminoles are trying to entice slaves to run away from the Georgia plantations, the South Carolina plantations. Um, it's all about slavery and it's all about race. And Florida, much to the surprise of many Floridians, uh, I don't quite know what the verb is for this, but Florida has more, had more lynchings per capita than any other state which is a thing that I can tell you the Chamber of Commerce and the Tourism Board do not want sort of bandied about. Um, if you're interested in this sort of thing, uh, Gilbert King, who is a great writer, he wrote two books just about Lake County. Lake County is special in a lot of ways. Um, and odd, and you wouldn't think of Lake County as some real old South place because of where it is, but it was. 
And Gilbert King's two books, um, one called The Devil in the Grove, which won a Pulitzer Prize. Uh, it's about Thurgood Marshall, Marshall and basically the lynching of young men who were falsely accused of raping a white woman. And another one called Beneath the Ruthless Sun that's a much more complex, weird story. Um, also set in Lake County, but really lays bare a lot of the racial underpinnings. I mean, Florida thinks of itself now as a Sunbelt state, not a Southern state. But Florida's history and its social attitudes and many of its laws really go back to the Old South or the reaction of white Southerners to Reconstruction. You know, we're, we're still fighting that battle. We're still fighting the battle of, if, if y'all recall, uh, whew, I can't remember the number, nearly two-thirds of Floridians voted for Amendment 4, which said let former felons, as long as they weren't murderers or rapists, vote. And you'd think that was a clear thing to say, and the pushback has been monumental. And the reason that felons in Florida cannot vote after they finish their sentences is dates back to a reaction against reconstruction attempts to allow former slaves to vote. If you decree, decree that stealing a loaf of bread is a felony, then you'll never vote and hungry people will steal a loaf of bread. So it's a long, nasty history. I'm sorry to say. It certainly is, but I think it's, it, brings up something interesting which is i want to i wonder if you could just talk a little bit more about um you know what drew you to english as a discipline and the reason why i ask it is because you know you you're you're bringing in a lot of history and, and culture and things like that and i think you get a lot of that out of you know studying english uh, as a discipline so i wonder what is it that originally drew you um to english and and studying that and and using it as a profession and what sort of sustains you as, as being in that space? Oh, books take you so many places. Books take you wherever you want to go, places that aren't even real. Um, it's wonderful. Um, and I think what drew me was just the power of language, which you could do with language to create, again, to create a world out of language. William Bartram's, language about Florida is so, I mean, you would just kill to get here if you didn't know about the mosquitoes. Uh, I mean, the way he writes about it, the power of language. I mean, remember we're, we're a country that we, we sort of grew out of words. We our founding documents are beautiful. Um, and we have always loved I think in America loved what language can do and where it can take us. And I think of English as being, you kind of mentioned it, it's, it, it takes in so much to be able to read. I don't know. I think if you read Dickens, you probably ought to know something about uh, how the poor were treated in 19th century England. Um, that there were no labor laws to speak of and children as young as four were put to work in factories um, and as young as six were put down the mines, you know, um, that kind of gives you a sense of what culture he comes from and what he was saying. Um, and I think too, that you can be just transported out of your everyday reality. So reading and writing, you know, everybody loves stories. I think stories are a basic human thing. We need to tell stories, stories that take us somewhere else, but also stories that help us understand who we are. And writers are always trying to tell a story about other people and places, but also about themselves, ultimately about themselves. So I got into English. I mean, I was going to give you what the real answer is, which is that I wasn't good at much else. I used to say to people, because I'm crap at television repair, but nobody repairs TVs anymore. You just go get a new one. They've gotten cheap. But um, I, I liked English because it seemed to take in all disciplines except math. 
there wasn't a lot of math for which I'm grateful. But, you know, it has taken science and it takes in history and sociology and politics and everything else. Um, and I'm, I'm seeing, I, I don't want to not get to these questions. A land remembers, which everybody loves. And I love too. I think it's an absolutely wonderful book. And it's maybe a bit, oh, it ignores some of the racial realities that, I think just weren't part of that writer's experience, which is okay. Not everybody has to, has to write about everything. You know, um, my writing about Florida tends to be about, I've been yelled at for writing about North Florida, but North Florida is what I know. North Florida is my Florida. Um, my experience with South Florida is, is sort of treating it as a fantastic, especially Miami, a fabulous other country. Somebody once said about Miami, and I think this is a bit snarky, but I'd take it as a compliment that the great thing about Miami is that it's so close to the United States. And uh, I think the value of Miami is that you get, you get 50 cultures and you get all the good food of those 50 cultures in that city, that wonderful, wonderful city. And then, you know, you can go to Key West and you're in another kind of culture. Um, these are places I love, but they're not places that I know. I did not, you know, grow up living and breathing them. Um, and whether Florida's going to be a nightmare or not, I don't know. I do know that I was laughing in a kind of cruel, unkind way reading a piece about how developers are building on every tiny spit of land in South Florida, every bit of barrier Island they can get their paws on now. And, and they're selling condos. They're selling condos and high rises on fill dirt. My father was a civil engineer and he, um, he was horrified at the use of fill dirt to put, put up big buildings in, Biscayne Bay, because, you know, there's only so much land. Miami Beach is bigger than it was naturally because they dumped a whole bunch of dirt on it. You know, it needed to be bigger, so it got some dirt. Mr. Fisher was keen on having a bigger place, put more hotels. And I think you all realize that sea level rise by itself is going to be a problem there. Uh, climate change creates bigger, worse hurricanes. Um, I look at Miami, Dade. I look at the Keys. We know what's going to happen with the Keys. Uh, you, you, there's nothing to be done. They're, they're at sea level and sometimes below. Uh, Tampa Bay. These are real problems. These are not insurmountable problems, but we had to have started yesterday. So that can be a bit of a nightmare. I, I think... A good thing has happened in that we have got rid of, I hope, fingers crossed, those three stupid toll roads that the state, no, I take that back. It wasn't the state. Certain people wanted to build through North Florida and Central Florida, destroying panther habitat, et cetera. Nobody can figure out one good reason for those roads. And so I think they're going to die. That is a good thing because we don't have the fresh water for the people that think they want to move to Florida. I don't know where they think they're going to get it from. Um, I don't know if anybody here is from Hallandale, but the municipal wells in Hallandale uh, are full of salt water, not fresh water because sea level rise does that. Limestone is porous. So you don't have to read very much about what, what limestone does to realize that we have big problems. Um, on the other hand, you know, <laughs> it's it's what happens. You know, the shoreline of, of the Gulf, say, around Tampa Bay, used to be about 50 miles west of St. Petersburg. Florida used to be bigger. It's been bigger, it's been smaller. It's been bigger, it's been smaller. And there will come a point where a lot of the state won't, won't be above water and most of us will be gone, but that's still a freaky thought. 
So I don't know if that's a nightmare or not. I, I think maybe, maybe we'll start to get a clue. But then I've said that before. Um, I'm seeing, oh my goodness. A well, good it's, 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 it, in summarizing the question that's, that was asked um, by, by Pamela, I think one of the questions is, you know, as we have a lot of these things happening, um, you know, in terms of the challenges of sea level rise and wanting to have uh, narratives that are perhaps more inclusive of different cultures and different oh, experiences. Yes. How do we how do we go about doing that? How do we go about crafting those those types of narratives? And you know, how does English, you know, as a discipline, potentially help us do that? I hope that certainly what I teach, I teach writing, and I hope given the increasing diversity of our students. Uh, and encouraging them to tell their stories uh, because that's how we learn. How would any of us know anyone else's story uh, if we never spoke to or read something by a person who wasn't just like us? And this is a problem that we have in America a lot, that we tend to talk to people that are just like us. But I hope that increasingly, especially in a state like Florida with such wonderful diversity. I mean, this is such a diverse state. This is a state that has just so many grand cultures that we need to learn about. We need to, Florida State, I'll just use my own university as an example. Uh, when I first got to Florida State, the, you know, there would be a few Latino and Latina students, um, but mostly it was like white kids or black kids. Now we've got kids who are second generation Haitian American, and who are very different from African-American kids. I mean, most of these Haitian kids are trilingual. They speak English, French, and Creole, for example. Um, just having people meet each other. This is something that education can do. It always mystifies me that uh, we don't spend a lot more on education because education, especially before college, this is, I'm not, trying to uh, you know, suggest that I don't make a nice living, which I do, and I am spoiled rotten because I get to teach these brilliant young persons. But it's we really, really need to embrace other people and other people's stories because they're our story. Haiti is not this faraway, strange place. Haiti is central to the history of America and especially the South. You know, Haiti uh, and Florida, Haiti and Louisiana, these, these are cultures entwined and they've always been entwined with each other. And we, I don't know why we don't acknowledge that and celebrate it, except that I guess we're, we can be scared of other cultures. And given the history of, of racism here, we're still trying to work out our own past. And I think if we were a lot more honest about it, this goes back a bit to the question about plantations, where now a lot of them, instead of just talking about how lovely they were and wasn't it grand to live like that, and, you know, have everything done for you, which I'm sure it was if you were a white upper class person at the time, but everybody else was working really, really hard. Um, we now talk about that. You know, that's not hidden anymore in the same way that it was. Some people are upset about that. They don't want to hear it. It's They want to hear that everything was grand and that Americans have never done anything that was bad or that hurt other people or that hurt each other, for heaven's sake. I think grown up countries can handle the difficulties of their past. If you look at the Germans, they're handling it. They're dealing with the horrors of their past. Uh, in Britain, they're beginning much more to deal with their part in slavery. Um, there's a slavery museum in Liverpool, of all places, that is just phenomenal. Uh, Liverpool was the center of the slave trade. Instead of going, we didn't do it, it wasn't that bad if we did, grown-up countries say, right, we did it, we better talk about it, we better think it through. Um, because we all know that a lot of the American empire or prosperity or greatness 
was built on the black back of enslaved people who were making a lot of money in sugar and cotton and tobacco for their owners. Uh, the same in Britain and France. And I think it's best to talk about this. We don't have to feel bad about it. We don't have to go around feeling guilty and apologizing. Would kill us, but you know, if you're a white person, if you're descended from slaveholders, as I am, um, I don't obsess over this, but I sure as heck don't want to run away from it. I think in Florida, we need to acknowledge this. And the first thing to acknowledge is that we have a history. We're not a beach with no history. You know, there's a story. And if we start to tell our stories, if we start to tell Florida's stories, it will be so much harder for us to hate each other. And it'll be so much harder for us to destroy things we shouldn't destroy. We've already lost a lot. Um, so everybody, it's incumbent on everybody to read a book about it. That's what you should do. Oh my no, God. It certainly is. Question. And <laughs> I, I think there's, there's one other question that I wanted to, yeah. to try to ask you uh, for this evening. And, um, I'm kind of just curious with some of these these changes and, and modifications and things like that that have happened to um, some of our landscapes. Is there one in particular, either a category or a very specific um, change or transformation that you think is perhaps underappreciated or just really unique or, or bizarre or the one that, that perhaps might speak to you the most? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I, I live or was raised, I don't live there now, but uh, still my family house, which what would have been a pretty treeless hill. And it, in my lifetime and several lifetimes before mine, it became a pecan farm, so it's pecan trees. So what I think of as this beautiful grove of pecan trees um, is relatively recent, maybe 150 years. And in a way, it would have been cool just to see it as a hill, but here it is. That's not quite answering your question because there are much better answers I'm trying to think of. And all I can think of is the bad ones, like the Cross Florida Barge Canal, which was a really <laughs> stupid idea. Um, mostly, um, what's happened is that nature has done stuff. You know, barrier islands weren't always islands, but they're wonderful. They're wonderful, interesting places. Um, storms come and do things like cut them in two. Um, so uh, all I can think of that nature has done, you know, it's just going to do what it does. But um, I think we're good at making parks in Florida. So I think the best thing we've done is try to stop destroying things. So Big Cypress Swamp, which is a miraculous place. And, you know, for us to, to not mess with it um, and failing that, I think, some of our wackier impositions of things that rich people bought. Um, I think the most, most fantastic house in Florida is the Ringling House in Sarasota, um, which is sort of an imposition on the landscape. And they were trying to make Sarasota Venice. It's a Venetian palace. And it's a nutty Venetian palace. Go to it if you haven't been. It is, it is a place that my mother referred to. She didn't like it. She said it was gaudy. Of course, it's gaudy. Circus people owned it. I think it's absolutely glorious because it is a fantasy of both the circus and Italy and the stage and, you know, trying to see the Gulf of Mexico as the Adriatic. I think it's charming. It's relatively harmless, too. It, it, I don't think it's done great damage to anything. It's just sort of goofy. Um, and uh, other than that, I think that Janet Reno's mother's coquina house is the second coolest house in Florida. 
that Janet Reno's mother, who was a journalist, built a coquina house. And it is absolutely fantastic. It's in Kendall, still, still there. Very interesting. I hadn't heard at all about the the coquina house. I think it's something that's that's certainly worth checking out. Um, and I think it's there's just a lot that I think we've got to think about in terms of the way that we've changed our landscapes, um, you know, over the centuries. Whether we're talking about recent history, European settlements, or anything before that. So, um, again, just thank you so much for taking the time to, to be with us this evening. I really appreciate it. Um, and again, thank you to all of our audience members for joining us this evening. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning of our presentation, you are going to receive a survey. So we'd appreciate it if you could take the time to fill that out for us. And we also have our program coming up with Braver Angels, Families and Politics. That's going to be Tuesday, December 15th at 630. You can learn more and sign up for that program by going to floridahumanities.org slash events. And so with that, again, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you all. You, you know, y'all are very kind. You ask really good questions, really good questions. And uh, I appreciate your, your patience and your tolerance. And I'm sorry I can't see you. But uh, <laughs> another time. One day we'll, we'll have a real one of these. And that next program sounds really good and really useful for, um, you know, avoiding bloodshed at Christmas. So thank you again. And thank you, Keith. All right. Thank you. And good night to you all. <laughs>